Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. two guest speakers sharing for 10 minutes each. We'll then be selecting people from the room to share for five minutes each, concluding the meeting with a final 10-minute guest speaker. Uh, Speakers will get a one-minute wrap-up card and a finished card. If you have already been asked to share at this convention, please decline to give others a chance. The topic for this meeting is the joy of living. Uh, The reading comes from the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. On page 15, we commenced to make many fast friends and the fellowship has grown up among us, of which it is a wonderful thing to fill a part. The joy of living we really have, even under pressure and difficulty. On page 16, there is, however, a vast amount of fun about it all. I suppose some would be shocked at our seeming worldliness and levity, but just underneath there is deadly earnestness. Faith has to work 24 hours a day in and through us or we perish. Most of us feel we need look no further for utopia. We have it with us right here and now. Each day, my friend's simple talk in our kitchen multiplies itself in a widening circle of peace on earth and goodwill to men. And on page 132, but we aren't a gone lot. If newcomers could see no joy or fun in our existence, they wouldn't want it. We absolutely insist on enjoying life. So I now ask our first guest speaker, Susie H. from New South Wales. Let's come up and share. Hi everybody, good morning, I'm Susie, I'm an alcoholic. <laughs> and the joy of living, I think we've, we've had it all uh, yesterday and today, haven't we? I've, you know, just had the kids laughing, I, you know, I'm sitting in meetings, people laughing, and I'm sure you all had a great time at the, the dance last night as well. I was somebody who, you know, I just couldn't imagine my life without alcohol. I just couldn't imagine how you could possibly have any kind of joy or fun or, you know, laughter or anything without alcohol. I just thought basically that alcohol equaled fun, creativity, joy, romance, you know, all of that. That's what I thought that it it equaled. And, of course, you know, I guess at some point, you know, sometimes there, there was a lot of fun and laughter, but, you know, underneath it all there was this awful like really awful sense of um, anxiety and fear of what everybody thought and what they didn't think. And and then, of course, you know, as it went on, is is there going to be enough, you know? Is there going to be enough to go around? And have I got enough? And then it was, how can I have, how can I get more without anybody noticing that I'm getting more, you know? How can I keep myself all together coordinated without my husband or my children seeing that I'm absolutely completely out of it. You know, my husband used to come home from work and he, because I used to do the whole, you know, ch- you know, changing the bottles around in the fridge so it looked like I'd only had one glass. And he'd say, well, darling, I just can't understand how you can be so drunk after just one glass. And of course, I'd already had, you know, at least a bottle before, you know. So all that, you know, dishonesty and deceit and the anxiety and the fear and the trepidation, um, it was just, for me, it became an absolute living nightmare. And it was really, you know, the four horsemen that it talks about in the big book, that was me, you know. Sort of three o'clock in the morning, the sheets were damp with perspiration, the anxiety, how was I going to manage my day? You know, I was an academic at a university and I used to have to give lectures to, you know, three or four hundred people on a stage like this. And, you know, I had to do things big time, you know, the alcohol was just pouring out of me. And anyway, you know, to cut a long story short, I I was somebody who I just couldn't give up alcohol, you know. I can say that to you and I know that you understand what I'm talking about, you know. I was drinking against my own will. But really, you know, my my motto was, you know, I can see that I want that. I, I can see that I need to give up alcohol. 
alcohol, but I just don't want to at the minute. And when I do, I'll let you know, you know, and then I'll do it. That's how I, and I really thought that I had some kind of control over it, that I would be able to make that decision when I gave up and when I didn't give up, you know. So it was actually quite a terrifying moment when I realised that actually I couldn't give it up at all. And I, and I actually, by that time, I was physically addicted to it, so I actually did need it just to stop the shaking and the horrors and all the rest of it. So, you know, I, I became a homeless person in Sydney, and, you know, I was just saying to my beautiful, lovely fiancé this morning, as we were walking in the sunshine, full of the joy, you know, of being in love and just being at a beautiful AA meeting and just being able to get up in the morning and not have to go out looking for alcohol, you know? And in my case, I would be crawling out of the bushes, out of the park with my hair in a haystack, you know, with all my clothes disheveled, if I still had any clothes, trying to find enough money and trying to find somebody that would sell me alcohol. So that's where this disease took me. And in that reading, it said something about the deadly earnestness of uh, the disease of alcoholism, and it really is, a, it's a killer, isn't it? It is a killer. You know, for me, by the time I was dying, and I really mean that in all sincerity, I was dying, I didn't really have long to live, and I had that pure, it's a pure gold moment, isn't it, when you have that really, you know, honest, heartfelt surrender to a high power. And that's what I had. And I made a commitment that I was going to do it all. Just going to do the whole thing. Whatever was suggested, I was going to do it all. I would do anything, anything to stop this obsession in my head and the soul sickness, you know, the emptiness in my soul and my spirit. And I knew, you know, that I, I had this little ember, you know, in my soul that still wanted to live. I still had that. It was just like a little fire, you know, the little embers in the fire. It was like, just like that. And I, I knew that I really did want to live and I wanted to see what was around the corner. And that has been my journey, you know, and that's nine and a half years and I haven't had a drink since that moment, which I just find absolutely extraordinary, you know, because I was somebody who I could not stop, I couldn't stop thinking about it and I couldn't stop drinking it. So to me, you know, the joy of living, you know, really is, you know, I, I understood really very early on that the answer was in this dance. And so I knew that I needed to find somebody who could make sense of these steps to me. You know, what does it mean? What does all this mean, you know? So what does it mean to be powerless? What does it mean to be unmanageable? What does it mean come to believe? I, you know, it was just all a complete mystery to me. And, of course, at that point I couldn't read. I couldn't really. I had to sit by the door because I was so traumatised and I couldn't, I didn't know, half the time I didn't really know who I was, you know. So I had um, some beautiful women in a fine light women's meeting in, in Sydney and they just surrounded me, you know, and just protected me all the time. I, and I realised actually that I needed almost like a 24-hour security around my sobriety. And I often used to talk about my sobriety as this beautiful diamond, you know, in a, in a black velvet box that needed full, full, you know, scale security because... My mind would take me to the bottle shop at the drop of a hat. You know, I had to make myself responsible. So the joy of living has really been shown to me by other people in AMA, you know. Many, many people actually have shared with me their experience, strength and hope. And I really gained the most, I suppose, from doing the steps, from applying the spiritual principles in my life. I just think it's, I think it's absolutely beautiful, you know, that I can start my day on my knees asking God to direct my thinking, show me what I'm supposed to be doing today, give me the courage to do that. Take away whatever's in the way, whatever defects in the way, just take it away so that I've got that real plucked in sense, you know, that spiritual energy flowing. And it's beautiful because I can just go through my day, I can go to work, I can act with integrity, I can speak up when I need to speak up, although that's, that's one of those ones, you know, that I need my practice on. <laughs> but I, I'm getting there, you know. I'm practicing that. I can see what my defects of character are, you know, which will always drive me back to getting a drink. So I can really see those things. And I guess, you know, it's a beautiful thing to be 
are actually, you know, fully connected to a, a spiritual power, you know, that's that's actually guiding my life and showing me what I'm supposed to be doing. I don't need to work it all out at all. My idea in the past was that I just needed to work harder. You know, I just need to work harder, push through, and then I'll be, you know, then I'll deserve, and I'll deserve, you know, at least one more point, maybe more, you know. That was my idea. But my idea today is, you know, I just love coming to these kind of rallies, and thank you for the committee for putting it on. I think you've done an amazing job. I love being in a room full of um, alcoholics who really get what I'm saying and understand what I'm talking about. Um, and yeah, I just I love being in AA. You know, I really do. It's it's the core of my life. And the program of AA, the twelve steps of AA, they are really they have really given me the recipe. You know, the instructions, the directions of how to live my life. You know, true, true to myself, and using the skills and the talents that that God has given me. You know, to the best of my ability. You know, and that's you know what more can you ask for? Really, you know. So thank you. So. Okay, I'm just going to call upon Tanti. And um, uh, this is a wonderful convention. I just, um, I just really am amazed how how um, professional and how attractive that the committee made the whole convention. Just in terms of like the emails coming out and that the fact that the thing that um, Anne's read, which I've got a copy in here, um, that I was sort of you know read from as well, but Anne's already read them out. Just really beautifully fitted in with the, the whole big book. It, it's just really great. I, I think you've done a fantastic job. Um, and just, yeah, give yourself a clap. You know, in the tradition it says attraction rather than promotion. Well, you hit that one right on the nail, that one. It's really attractive. Um, so the joy of living, you know, like those points that were pointed out. Um, I suppose when I, before I got sober, um, I had moments of joy of living, but nowhere near to the degree that I've had since I got sober. I got sober in 98, and, um, you know, I couldn't work out whether I was an alcoholic or not, um, but I went on a journey to find out. I knew I was addicted to marijuana, but I wasn't sure about alcohol, so I gave that up to marijuana, and then I kept drinking. And then I... Uh, saw the, um, what do they call the Whitlam's down at the Alexandra Hills Hotel one night. And uh, I got in the car and my mate said, oh, we'll have a joint. And I said, hurry up because I've got to get out in the next three suburbs. I got out of the car and walked across the bonnet, as you do. And uh, went, sat on the bed and went, oh, God, I'm stoned again. And I swore off if I was going to be so, um, so I looked into whether I was an alcoholic or not. And uh, I went on a journey and prayed. And I ended up in Armadale and found out... Um, a bloke walked up to me and said, I can't tell you whether you're an alcoholic or not, but I can help you find out. And uh, he took me through the big book and uh, took me through the steps. Without that, I would have been trying to cure my sick mind with my sick mind. And it doesn't work. You know, I, I got to quit playing God, as he says. It's all in this book. And um, last night, I, I couldn't be here last night. I was at my... Um, Nisi's 21st, and I was sober, and uh, it was great, all my family was there, and um, you know, it, it, it was just good to be there, and I was seeing my niece who drinks a lot, you know, I, I don't want to judge or anything, but I'm, I've got to keep a chair, maybe, for her in, in, in the next uh, couple of decades, maybe, um, but you know, it was just good to be there, and that part of the joy of living is... is, is Getting to these things, being able to be a part of, be part of my family, be part of um, celebrations, remember them, um, remember that they're coming up and remember them the next day after being there. 
you know, not in a blackout. And um, there's many, there's many things I, I wanted to touch on. Um, when I got home last night, I started to look, you know, at this at this topic and go through the book and the bits that the committees uh, put out. And I found some other pieces about the joy of living. You know, um, I wanted to. I looked long and hard at that at that for that bit where it says. And I'll find it now because I, I, I wrote it down. Um, uh, why don't I just read it rather than stumble through it? Um, I think it's the. Oh. There's too many things in this big book. It's the part that goes on about bills squarely met, you know, responsibilities met and all that kind of thing. But I will find it, so bear with me. Um, it's always rung very true for me, um, as if I could live my life that way, I probably would have peace in my head. And that's what I was after. Um, just a quiet head. Sometimes I didn't relate to being an alcoholic. I didn't drink in the morning. I didn't drink at work. Um, but I related to the thinking. And I went to the Cooper Room meeting, oh, um, I don't know when, about three years into sobriety, four years into sobriety, still sometimes questioning what, whether I was an alcoholic, so still not fully grasping the joy of living. And a bloke, um, his name is um, Tom. He's passed away now. I swear he was about seven feet tall that day. It's a disease of perception, you know, and you have the disease of perception in sobriety. And I swore he was stood on stage. But those of you who've been to that meeting in Jellico Street know there's no stage there. And uh, he looked up, he had a beautiful smile, he's an Irish guy, and he said, I, he said you know, I came to AA because I wanted peace in my head. And I went, oh God, I'm in the right place. Because that's, as it says in here, thinking is my problem. You know, drinking and all those things are symptoms of the disease. Thinking is the problem. And the joy of living today uh, allows me when my thinking becomes distorted that I'm aware of it. Before, the abnormal was normal. I didn't know that my thinking was thinking. I didn't know I had that problem. And today I'm aware of it. And it's those three A's. I know we're in AA, they're the two A's. The three A's are awareness, acceptance, and action. When I can be aware that I'm going on, I can then accept it and then pray for guidance about what action I should take to change that, change that uh, way of being. And then I have peace, and then I have a joy of living. And, um, you know, the joy of living that, that I've found many times in doing service in, in you know, being on committees and going to conventions and, and you know, can also be contrasted with being on those committees because sometimes it can be tough because we're full of personalities. People used to share that the only problem with Alcoholics Anonymous is that it's full of bloody alcoholics. <laughs> and that's true, but we're not a glum lot, you know. We know how to party, going to conventions in Canberra and that, the... The band, I remember being to a few conventions and the band used to say, you guys just don't want to go home. You, all you, normally we play and people don't get up to dance till about halfway through, you know, our, but you guys, everyone gets up straight away and just dances their legs off. We're, we're a fantastic lot of people and this program, I believe, has given me and gives us the, the joy of living, the, the, the ability to get in touch with who we really are. I always thought, you know, better than and less than, that was my thinking. I ended up under tables because I was drunk or standing on them, dancing, falling off with bleeding legs or standing on them and pontificating and, and thinking I knew everything. And now I can sit at a table. Now I can be um, equal to all in my thinking. And, of course, I'm human, I err, I do judge, but as I said, I can see that that thinking isn't the best. And then I asked to be guided to what, how I can be useful, you know. And um, I'm going to find this passage before I finish that. <laughs> um, the 
because, you know, as, as my friend Noel, who's um, not well at the moment, and uh, I pray for him and I ask you to do that, um, as he quotes Bill, you know, one more power drive. That it. You know, it's me playing God again and wanting to, um, wanting to think, oh, well, I can do this, I can fix this. And I'm probably doing this by trying to find this passage. And if I don't find it, well, so be it. Um, I was going through last night, you know, the, the, the um, different parts. I know where it is. See, it's not in the bloody big book, in the 12 be 12. And I was just seeing so much. In step 12, the beginning of step 12, the first three words are, four words are, the joy of living is the theme of AA's 12 step, and action is the key word. You know? And this part here, still more wonderful is the feeling that we do not have to um, be especially distinguished among our fellows in order to be useful or profoundly happy. Profoundly happy, pretty close to the joy of living. Not many of us can lead, be leaders of prominence, nor do we wish to be. Service, gladly rendered, obligations, squarely met, troubles, well accepted, or solved with God's help. The knowledge that at home or in the world outside we are partners in a common effort. The well understood fact that in God's sight all human beings are important. The proof that love freely given surely brings a full return. The certainty that we are no, that we are no longer isolated and alone in the self-constructed prisons. I heard that shared next door and I related to it. Isolation gives us a self-constructed prison. And the surety that we need no longer be square pegs in round holes, uh, but can fit and belong in God's scheme of things. These are the permanent and legitimate satisfactions of right living, for which no amount of pomp and circumstance, no heap of material possessions could possibly be substitute. True ambition is not what we thought it was. True ambition is the deep desire to live usefully and walk humbly under the grace of God. For me, that's the joy of living. And the joy of living is that I can wrap this up now and uh, and um, and let you all enjoy the rest of the convention a day at a time. Thank you. Speaking of a great committee, I'd like to ask the lady who's been working tirelessly at the registration desk. Katina, would you like to come up and share? It's really team effort. <laughs> uh, my name is Martina and I'm an alcoholic. I'll get that back to <laughs> You know, um, the joy of living. Um, you know, my sobriety date is the first of November, nineteen ninety four, and um, and I got sober eight days after my twenty first birthday, and um, I've been blessed to get sober in and around young people's um, conventions and AA. Um, in, in the states, and so um, you know, when I when I came here, and you know, you know, many years ago, I've been here almost nine years now, um, and I saw that there was, you know, this growing uh, young people's community and fellowship and uh, convention. You know, here in Queensland, I was really excited and I want to get involved in, you know, and I spoke at a few different conventions and then um, my joy of living started to happen for me, you know. Um, my family started happening. I, you know, had a few children and I wanted to get involved, but <sighs> I couldn't. <laughs> it was just, there was too much happening in my life and I was torn. I was really extremely torn and, and, um, and as much as I wanted to be a part of, you know, the committees that were happening each year to put on um, the annual um, Young People's, the QEPA that happened.
happens every year in Queensland, I couldn't. I just had too many other personal commitments. And then I, um, and then uh, a few God shots happened. Angie came down to the Byron Convention. She grabbed a sponsee of mine, grabbed her to come to the convention. That sponsee grabbed me to come to uh, a committee meeting. And, you know, the three of us converged at a committee meeting. And, you know, I got lit right back up because this is, you know, these conventions, and I'm going to cry. Look at the light. <laughs> planning conventions like this and being a part of this type of stuff is where my joy of uh, living comes you know being able to um, know where I can be a part of and bridge that gap of you know the demographics of you know I don't want to call it big people AA because I'm big people um, you know, and young people at A, you know, so where we can grab the young people coming in the door so like we can raise the bottom of, you know, people going out there and, and, you know, having to stay too long, you know, scraping their faces on their bottom that they can come in and get sober and know that there's, you know, a fellowship and there's recovery and that they can stay sober and they can come to conventions and get the message and we can bridge that demographics here and amazing Aussie Paw conventions, you know, in a room full of people, that's just, you know, putting on these conventions is where my joy of living comes. And, and I'm so glad that I was able to come onto this convention, you know, toil away, you know, you know, coming up to the Gold Coast to, you know, Brisbane monthly, you know, meetings and, you know, putting in our two cents and, and doing this stuff and coming together as a committee and, and, and putting on this amazing convention because I've loved I've loved putting on conventions and watching people, um, the message being carried to newcomers and, and, and the message being carried to old timers and the message being carried to people, you know, who have been here a long time, who are still suffering in the room, so can just kind of just scrape to a convention or whatever. And, um, and, and I'm so glad that you guys are all here to be a part of what I consider to be my joy of living. You know, I got sober in Alcoholics Anonymous and, and everything to me today, I know is a direct result of, of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I'm not talking about the outside stuff. I'm talking about the fact that um, what I used to be was a, a, a gun-toting, psychopath, drug-dealing um, nutbag from Los Angeles with no self-esteem, couldn't take my eyes off the ground, visual and auditory hallucinations. The left side of my face was paralyzed from, you know, an alcohol-induced car accident. I was not a vision for you, you know? Um, you know, today, I'm 21 years sober, you know, I have, um, I have a love and joy and care for you, you know, I have relationships with my family, I, I know how to be uh, a mother, a daughter, a sister, um, a wife, a business owner, you know, one amongst a committee, you know, um, you know, I know how to, you know, to be, you know, one of, as opposed to either, you know, being as low as the belly of a snake or, you know, this inferiority, you know, complex, you know, I know how to, um, you know, stick my hand out and, and greet people, you know, and I couldn't look people in the eyes before that. You know, I've got this um, sense of, um, of self-esteem and, and, and joy in my life, and that's all the direct result of Alcoholics Anonymous. And the steps and the traditions and the concepts of world service and learning how to do that all in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. So I thank you all. Thank you all for coming and being a part of this, and I love you and continue to be a part of this. And thanks. <laughs> Hello, everyone. My name is Michael. I'm an alcoholic. It's um, great to be. It's been a great weekend. 
I'm from up the sunny coast. Um, I'm, I'm very young in this um, sprouting, which is getting on towards a year. But the joy of life I've found, I've been looking for um, joy in life for 35 years. And um, yeah, I'd get a couple of seconds a day maybe or a few minutes or a week. And what I've found here is the joy of life was 24-7. And it wasn't that hard to, to get. I just didn't was never given a key to that door. So I spent years looking. You know, I had a business, I had a family, I had a wife, I had everything. I had the big boat, no joy in life. Um, quickly turn that around and take away all those things. No money, no boat, no wife. Not even sure for somewhere to live. Immense joy. I, I wake up and I'm smiling. You know, I woke up this morning, got to bed about one or two. Air bed had a hole in it. Not great. Woke up smiling. <laughs> a couple of Panadol. I'm still happy. You know, because I'm not dry reaching. I'm not, you know, head pound and looking for water. And I went, I'm coming to the place where I look around and I see people I don't know, but I feel like I'm at home for the first time since I joined an exclusive club and we all paid the highest price to get into this and it is expensive. And being here is just a wonderful joy because it's a joy of life that you can't get anywhere else when you're an alcoholic. And, and I'm just so grateful to be here and have that key. And my goal in life now is to actually one day give that key to someone else so they can hopefully get it way before I did, you know, which I stand here and I might look like I'm 50, but I'm actually only about 25 because I'm young because I only got sobriety less than a year ago. Thanks, everyone. Uh, Chrissy, can you... Yeah, thanks, David. Would you like to share? It's really hard. You've got next door, you know, working with others, which is a great topic, and then you've got the joy of living in here, so you've got two great meetings happening at the same time. My heart's pounding. It always does. I've been sober for 23 years, and I uh, got sober when I was 21. So, and, uh, you know, I'm still alive, and uh, that's good, and uh, and it's really beautiful when you have an Aussie power. I've been to a few... Uh, one of my when I first got sober, I went to a great um, convention, my very first convention, and it was the um, Yui Park. And I remember reading on the front, you know, about I love it. I love your flyers; have been fantastic. Everybody's welcome. Every meeting, we we read them out. We read flyers, and that's really important that you read all that stuff out at every meeting you go to. And um, and everyone would say, "Oh no, no, it's young." I said, "No, no, 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 no. It's, it's been put on by young people for everyone." You know. And um, and it was lovely that our last speaker spoke about his uh, your first year in sobriety. And I've been really lucky enough in Alcoholics Anonymous. When I first came in here, um, there wasn't many people my age. And uh, there was three of us around the same age as me. And uh, lovely when I first met Martina because I knew she was from overseas. And, and she came in the same time as me. But I was um, on the Gold Coast. Uh, there was a lot of twin set and pearls and... It was a bit different than me, and I came in, I loved the cure, and I had these jeans that were ripped, and I had, um, like, I was a little bit different from everybody else, and I was young, and everything that came out of my mouth sounded like a fire truck, you know, and it was, <laughs> and these beautiful, beautiful women in Alcoholics Anonymous with their twin set of pearls would come up and just love me, and they would just say, keep coming back, Chrissy, and it'll be all right, and you don't need to speak like you're in the pub anymore. And, you know, and part of me just wanted to do this. 
but the other part of me wanted to just be nurtured and loved by these beautiful women in Alcoholics Anonymous. And I heard once in Alcoholics Anonymous that men will pack your ass and women will save your ass. That is so true for me. And because uh, I was a person that never hung around women, hated women with a passion, and I hated men, so I was really lonely in Alcoholics Anonymous for a very long time. And because uh, I was full of fear as a woman, and I don't know if you relate to this, I never wore makeup, lipstick, um, I, uh, Levi's jeans were my, you know, staple for everything. I had every pair of Doc Martin, com, you name it. Um, but I just had so much fear. If I meet a woman, you know, a friend in AA, they won't like me, so I broke up, you know. So it's just had a lot of fear is what I'm saying. It took me about two years before I made a woman friend in Alcoholics and I was, you know, have a coffee. And I had like a, I was like cheating. I used to write on my hand. What do you do for a living? Like, you know, I had no idea how to have a conversation with a person or anything. Going up the track, I'm 23 years sober. I went on and studied in sobriety. I brought my sponsor to my first class. She came and sat with me because I was terrified. I was like 24 and my sponsor comes to my class with me and, and I was sitting there and then Katie says, you know, can I go now? Like, you know, after it was like, <laughs> I said, yeah, you can go, Katie. And, and um, I was like, you know, I was the kid that kicked out of school, was in trouble all the time, you know, locked up from my great disorder. It's interesting we're in Beanley. This is where I grew up. Um, I went to school here in Beanley. Um, I'm, I got locked up here in Beanley. Um, I'm a show kid, so I used to live at the Beanley showgrounds. So it's really funny coming here. I still feel a lot of, probably a lot of fear and anxiety, but the good thing is that I'm here um, sober today. So down the track, I've got a beautiful husband. I've got a beautiful daughter who's 21, never seen me drink. I now wear pearls. I work in a library, which is quite interesting. Uh, you know, I'm the twin set and pearl type of person. I work in a library. I don't drink. I don't smoke. I love floristry and I box. So there you go. And... Uh, Yes, I'm a I'm all rounder, and I've still got the same sponsor that I had when I first came in, and she still loved me, and I'm just really grateful to be here. You've done a wonderful job. I would have been here yesterday, but unfortunately, I have to work because just because I'm sober, people don't give me money. I have to work. So, love being here. Thanks for putting on this convention. It's great. <laughs> Call upon Shay. Oh, Baba. Hey, guys, my name is Shane. I'm an alcoholic. Yeah. Choice of living. What a bit of life today. today. After last night, I'm so bloody tired. <laughs> yeah. And I don't have a hangover. In the beauty, I remember what I did last night. There were times when I was never invited to pubs, never invited to parties. Uh, my family kicked me out because of my drinking because I couldn't, couldn't, couldn't be trusted. Today's different. I got sober. Um, took a long time to get sober. I bummed around Brisbane for a while. I was like a, um, a ship without a runner. I was going around around the circles, getting nowhere. I was coming to AA, but I wasn't in AA. I was absorbing it, but I was, I was just faking it. But today I realised this weekend's been an eye opener for me. I haven't done no work. In AA. I have listened to a lot of it. I've had, I've memorised a lot of things. I haven't actually really read the big book. But nobody's actually took take me through the big book. You know? And I'm originally from Sydney. Please don't hold that against me. And, um, yeah, it took me, um, I, will, I couldn't control my drinking. And it just become so much of a, Groundhog Day. Every day I had to go on to the same thing, same thing. The rush would start Tuesday night, straight before payday. They were gone Wednesday, got a new pay, payday was around, drink was around. Into the pub I was in. 
And that just went on and on for 20 odd years. In Adelaide, A. I I went on long service leave for a while from AA. 10 years. <laughs> now, I got my time, so. And I found a relationship in my business in that time, and I, I did all the good things, top thing. Um, but I only, only realised this a couple of weeks ago that um, I actually had a mistress with me as well. She was alcohol. She dominated my life completely. It took, it took me to um, half a department of housing house in Cowra, Cor- 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 Best mistake I've ever, ever made in my life. I got down there on my own, had nobody around me. And I was sitting in the pub trying to drink. One day it just did not work. I believe it was my high power stepped in, because I've been around a lot, lot, lot longer. It said, time's up. He walked in and said, like, switch off. The party's over now, Shane. Get your ass back, AA. I've done that ever since. Haven't had to pick up a drink for the last three, three and a half years. And I've never been that sober in my life. Today, um, shake a lot of leaf now, but um, today, I, uh, today, I'm um, so grateful that I come up this weekend. A friend of mine from um, Ipswich and Sierra kind of got to come with me to some um, weekend. They said, I'm going to come up. And I have so many, so many, so many things to be grateful with. A friend of mine gave me places to get up here. I've done that. I've got up here. I've walked in the door and I've been so much welcomed and so much loved. And this is what AA is all about. Not being on your own. Not being on an island. Come together with unity. Thank you for that. Thank you, Bill and Bob. Thank you. George, would you like to just come up and chat? weekend it's been amazing um yeah and it was all due to pretty much these two people on the uh, <laughs> stage here got roped into helping out this is all part of the service and uh, you have to do your service work so yeah put my hand up for um waitressing which turned into tea and coffee which turned into something else and now i'm up here nervous as hell um <laughs> And last night I actually danced uh, sober and, and yeah, couldn't believe it. Uh, I really didn't think that would ever happen. Um, I was relaying the story about if my sister saw me up on the dance floor, she'd send me home from the pub because I'd definitely had enough. Um, yeah, and last week was the birthday of my um, home group, Green Slopes. Uh, getting involved there. Um, is I have to meet and greet, <laughs> which is a good one for me because, uh, yeah, pretty much I like staying in the corner and, and, yeah, that gets me out of meeting people and trying to remember people's names. And that was a fantastic night. I was um, high, high from a sober high, and I, yeah, didn't realise that was possible. Um, yeah, at the beginning I thought alcohol gave me confidence. It um, allowed me to talk to people, to come out of my shell, um, and in the end it stripped me of all confidence. I wasn't able to do anything. Um, I drank for work. I drank during um, lunch breaks. Um, I wasn't able to talk to people. Um, so, yeah, the joy of living for me is actually being part of this and, um, yeah, being a part of it and actually um, yeah 
having those um, sober highs that I didn't realise were possible. <laughs> Thank you. Just call upon Taylor from Victoria. G'day guys, Taylor Alcoholic. Okay. Oh, it's good to be. <laughs> I bought this for um, my sixth birthday, uh, about I mean, June 18th, just, just, just gone, to come in the States and sell t shirts, and I love them. <laughs> It's really good to be here. Um, obviously, I'm from Melbourne, Victoria, and um, what a gift to be up here in you know, another state. A lot warmer than Melbourne at the moment. Um, you know, I got sober at uh, 20 years old, and you know, my my drinking career was very short. Uh, my sponsor always says that you know I drank the drag car. You know, um, it was all enough to stay away. Um, and that was you know just, just how life went from after I drink uh, before I drank. Through school, like in high school and primary school, you know, I was socially awkward, didn't fit in, and just felt different, and um, had a really tough time getting along with life. Um, I had all the isms before I drank. I was restless, really discontent um, in my own skin. Couldn't control my emotions and just didn't know how to deal with life. And then when I found alcohol, that all changed, you know. Um, I became this new person and I could, I could go through my day and, and do life. You know, uh, and very quickly for me, it was, you know, get up and drink, go to work and drink, um, before school drink, you know. Um, for my first drink, I knew I was an alcoholic. I got alcohol in my family and I drank differently, you know. Uh, when I drank, I just had to have more and I thought, shit, you know, I just, I love it so much and I was like, this, this is not good. Um, you know, coming into alcoholics, I was, uh, I was done. I was really hopeless. And I couldn't I couldn't do drinking anymore. It wasn't working for me. Uh, my days were a mess. My family didn't want to know me. I wasn't quite at Christmas. You know, I was this real black sheep. Um, I had a great family, a good upbringing, but I just destroyed all of it. You know, I'd burned all my bridges. Uh, my friends didn't want to know me. I had nowhere to live. You know, that was my existence. And, you know, I, I still drank and... I, I came home, home one day just begging for help, begging, you know, I need help. I need to get into a rehab. I need something. I just can't continue living this way. Um, you know, I, I, um, I was just done. I was done. And I, and I, I knew about AA and uh, it worked for my grandfather and all my family. Uh, but coming in, I was, not only was I, you know, hopeless, I thought I knew everything, um, but I was shit scared inside. I was really scared. I was a scared kid. That I just didn't know if I could get sober and it would work. And I thought, I, you know, I was different and, you know, I wouldn't get it. So luckily for me, you know, down in Melbourne, I found a group of guys uh, that had stuff I wanted. You know, they were happy, they had a smile on their face. And I was anything but. Uh, leaving my house without a drink was, you know, panic attack, get sick, pass out. I just couldn't do it. But these people had a smile on their face. They were happy to be there. And they were warm, welcoming, and loving to me. And I just, I honestly just did what they did. Whatever they suggested I do, I did. You know, they picked me up, took me to meetings. They told me, you know, clean up tea and coffee, whatever. I just did. You know, I thought it's worked for them. But if I do what they say, you know, I'll get sober. And, you know, going through those steps in the wall, I got straight into it. You know, I got a sponsor that uh, was someone I knew and I really liked the story and I really um, identified with him. And uh, I loved that he, he always said, like, you know, everything's a suggestion. You know, there's no, you know, you can't do it, but he used to tell me, he's like, it's a suggestion when it comes out of my mouth, but it's a good man, you've got the tear ears. You know, I really liked that, you know, and I needed that. That was, that was great for me. Um, and I came from a very regimented home group, and, you know, I was very service-bound, and, and that's what I needed, you know. Um, I didn't need the, you know, cuddling, it's okay, you know, you're all right. You know, I needed to be caught on my bullshit, you know, told, you know, that hurts my work because that's just what I need, you know. And um, my life today, oh, it's just so far removed, you know. Nothing to do externally, but the gift of, you know, I can get up here and talk to you guys and feel somewhat okay about it. <laughs> that's just a miracle. You know, I went from someone that couldn't leave my house and drink, 
you know, shirt and shit and that's to someone today that can, you know, get on a flight and go and stay this at the wing um, is great, you know. Uh, what, what a gift to be given, not just to not have that obsession and that desire to drink today, a gift to have a real life, you know, good experiences, friends and family that want to talk to them, they want to see you know, bring me up and want to, you know, like, it's not what I was used to at all. Um, so I just thank you guys for this convention. It's been fantastic. Then do you share this weekend? Yeah, of course. The lady in the blue, on the, would you like to share? Have you shared this weekend? Would you like to go and share? Zero and I'm an alcoholic. Um, I've been in and out of AA for years. Uh, I had a drink 11 days ago. Um, yeah, I sort of, um, I've just moved into state. Um, so I was very happy to find out an AA group close to me. Uh, yeah, and the commonalities I find in these meetings, um, yeah, just the discomfort with myself and the awkwardness and the, uh, all these things that I hear other people say and I, I relate so well to the stories that I hear. Um, and, yeah, I just want to be a decent human being again. Um, I did go for a time two and a half years without drinking and then a period of four months, four and a half months and this and that, but um, I spent quite a few years drinking. Um, but, yeah, the, the effect that alcohol has on me turns me into a um, conceited, uh, cocky sort of idiot with no real confidence but this pseudo bravado um, face, but, um, yeah, it's, um, good to be sober today, and, uh, yeah, I think in AA before, I, I didn't really, uh, I think I took it seriously, I, I, I sort of skirted around the edge, and like somebody's already said, um, um, I went to AA, but I wasn't in AA. But I'm really starting to, to listen and understand how how it's very much a mental disease. Like my thinking is just crazy. Um, and somebody used the sentence, my own sick mind won't cure my own sick mind. And I just thought, oh, thank you for saying that because it just resonates with me so much. Um, I love to see and hear the, the grace, if you like to put it that way, of the old timers who had this, I don't know, this core of something that I want. Um, anyway, I'm extremely grateful to be here, so thank you. I just want to ask the gentleman in the black glasses, Tom, would you like to share? My name is Gordon, I'm an alcoholic, an addict, and I've pretty much heard my story here today. I got sober when I was 18 years old, and now 45, or well, 44, 45 this year, and I didn't get sober straight away. Um, it took me two years to really accept that I was an alcoholic, and that I couldn't drink with any safety. And, you know, it took that two years of coming to these rooms and listening to all of the 
all of the different sets. Um, you know, and I did. I listened to everybody's differences, and I hadn't done this, and I hadn't done that. And, you know, there were so many differences. And, you know, it, it just took that time, you know, to, to really <clears throat> accept that I was an alcoholic. And, and, you know, I don't really know exactly why I got sober young. You know, it's not really my doing. Uh, I, I believe that it's God who actually really got me sober, you know, because I really didn't want to get sober, you know. Um, you know, I came into these rooms and I came in through Narcotics Anonymous originally because I knew I was a drug addict. I knew that I had a problem with, you know, shooting up speed and smoking dopes and, and popping pills and, you know, having, you know, alcoholic sessions and, uh, you know, the mess, you know, and, um, you know, and I came into these rooms and I just, you know, came along really because, you know, NA people go to AA and I'd come to AA at Stella Mara's in Sydney and I'd be there every day with my mates and we'd all be chatting, you know, all, all young group of people and we'd all hang out together and we'd go out for coffee and we'd go out to gay nightclubs up and off to the street till three in the morning and we were partying, you know, but we were sober, you know. But for me, it just took that extra two years to really understand that I actually had a disease inside me, you know, that it wasn't going away, you know, that alcoholism doesn't actually go away. And I remember, you know, I remember walking out of Stella Mara thinking I'm going to drink and I walked out of the meeting and that was an AA meeting and I went up to the Oxford Hotel and I remember after 22 months of being sober, just ordering a beer and I ordered a beer and I remember having the first sip of that beer and something in my head just clicked and I realised I was an alcoholic. And I knew from having that one sip of beer that the compulsion had already set in place and I, I just couldn't put it down, you know. And, you know, I had many relapses. I uh, got tried to get sober again and I ended up in the hospital and another suicide attempt and, you know, I ended up in the hospital and, and uh, you know, and it just took many relapses, you know. And, you know, I owe my life to Stella Mars in a lot of ways because I went to that meeting after taking two other members out. We all decided to go out and drink, even though we were young as well. And we went out and we all had a relapse, and it was disastrous, you know. And I remember going to Stella Mars, and I really only wanted to go there just to tell everybody to go and get fucked. I hated AA, you know, because AA had actually destroyed my drinking, you know, and I was only young, and I thought, fuck, you know, and I went there and I walked into the meeting, and I got halfway down, and I remember, and I mumbled, fuck off, you know, and I just sat down on the steps, there were like steps like this at the back of the meeting, and everybody still smoked in those days, and they were all crazy. And I just burst into tears. And something happened at that meeting, and I don't know what happened, but, you know, the reality is I walked out of that meeting, and, you know, uh, I um, walked out. I remember ordering McDonald's. I was on the nod. I remember waking up in the hospital, you know, at RPA, which had been many times from suicide attempts, and... You know, and I just said that simple prayer, please help me, you know, and I don't know what happened, but the compulsion left me, you know, I didn't want to drink anymore. And I went to meetings, and to this day, I still don't understand why God put people into my life who I needed, you know. Um, I had a sponsor who is today still my sponsor 25 years later. And I love that man, you know, and, you know, he uh, understood that I had chronic depression and I suffered from, you know, chronic depression where I actually had, you know, not only alcoholism but also depression. And I met a psychiatrist who um, was also the head of um, McKinnon 
detox. And, and to me, it just seems to me that God put people into my life who I needed at that time, you know, and it wasn't my doing, you know. It was God's plan for me to be sober today, you know, and to be free from this disease, you know. Um, you know, and I'll never really be fully free from this disease because I'm the type of alcoholic who I, I believe I'll always have this disease, you know, and that's really dependent on me working the steps and putting the steps into my life, you know. If I don't come to these rooms, I go crazy. That's it, you know. If I stop praying, I go crazy. If I stop calling people and isolating, I go crazy. And you know, so for me, it's a daily program. That's not just, you know, once in a while. You know, it's a daily program. And I forget I'm an alcoholic, yeah. and I can easily forget that this is a daily program. You know, um, you know and somebody touched on, I'll only be one for a second, but somebody touched on home, you know. Whenever I come to an, an AA meeting, I feel like I'm at home here. I feel it. I feel it. At ease with myself, you know, that's the freedom of having this, these rooms, new people in my life, you know. I have freedom today, you know, I don't have that when I don't come here, you know, and I feel like I'm at home here. I don't know many new people, I'm from Malaysia, you know, and that, you know, is another thing in, in my life, you know, I've been able to travel the world. So to get out of my flat, you know, a little cool and to to, you know, not be able to actually get out of the flat and be in total isolation to travelling the world and be in different countries is truly amazing to me, you know. And this program has given me my life back, you know. Um, and I really can't thank the people enough for, you know, uh, being here and giving them my life back, you know. Thank you. Row, would you like to share? <laughs> <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm Joanna Holly. Um, I do feel like home when I'm here. And in part of the rooms. And it's a great feeling because for a long time I've always had a house where I've never felt like I've had a home. And that just makes me emotional just thinking about it. Um, I desperately didn't want to share today. And the reason why I didn't want to share is because I'm just a little bit lost at the moment. And I feel like I want to share because I want to be able to carry the message. And I feel like I haven't got a very strong message at the moment, but all I can do is be honest with myself. My son's here today, and he loves being mentioned. And then he goes, he said, why don't you want to share, Mum? We normally do really good shares. And I said, because I feel insecure today. I think it's been good to be honest to my son because I used to hide in a room and drink and never wanted to show him my feelings, you know. And um, the insecurity that that brought for me and, and for him, is in it's, and it's okay to feel... And um, he wanted me to share about that. I used to, um, I never wanted to leave the house, and if I did leave the house, it would be straight to the bottom road to go to bed. A four pattern would stop 10 percenters, you know. They taste horrible, horrible, but um, I could do a short amount of damage if a 10 percent four pack and you know, wasting a couple of hours to get to, get to that point. Um, also, today is really just be honest with where I'm at. So at the moment, um, I have been struggling. And the reason why I've been struggling is because I haven't been doing my daily recovery plan. Um, I don't ever want to forget where I've come from and how much I struggled and how broken I was. Today I'm not broken. I don't hate myself how I once hated myself, but I, I just like myself and I can't wait until I love myself. But um, the change in me, I've got 19 months up, and the change in me, the change in me 
the more comfy I get and the less anxiety you have, I can see I can see that reflect on my children. And that's a really beautiful thing to see. Um, you know, and I remember when I first started the program was in I didn't believe in God and I didn't believe in a higher power that I had nothing to lose, so I just did it and I did it on a regular but on a regular basis and as I got about three, four months in months up. I started to notice the change. Um, you know, I surrendered and I spent those three, four months fighting something and being in denial and once I stopped being in denial and just surrendered as in it all started making sense and the high power started to work for me. Um, so I'm grateful for that. I think you have to get to that point where you've got that desperation enough that you just want to change and you just, I just want to live. Some days I feel like I still want to survive, but other days I, I really do want to live. And um, I don't know, I, I just, I'm grateful and I've got a lot more work to do, but I think at the moment the reason why I'm feeling lost is because I've been running on self rule and I've got to be honest with myself, you know, it's not that, it's not, I put so much pressure on myself, like it's not that hard to do these steps. You know, and when I first started, I wanted to do, you know, I was so eager and I wanted to start, but I've, you know, I've been running off self-will and trying to run my own race, and that's why I feel uncomfortable with myself at the moment is because I have been running my own race. Um, you know, I need to remove this running off self-will and just do what I need to do because those times when I do what I need to do, I'm saying, I don't, I don't feel insane, you know. When I first walked into these rooms, I was extremely insane. And my moments of sanity come back to me when I'm not doing the suggested things and I'm not doing my program. Um, so I know the difference from when I am running well and when I'm not running well. And it's just because I need to give my good, myself a good kick up the bum sometimes and, you know, get back into what works for me and what I've seen has worked for everyone else. And... Yeah, AA is just a beautiful thing, and I'll just leave it there. I uh, just want to ask if there's any males that like to share that haven't obviously shared over the weekend. Come on down. <laughs> Thank you. Enjoy it, baby. Yeah, hi, my name's Mark. I'm an alcoholic. I didn't realise I'd be standing up here. <laughs> Well, thanks for asking me to share. And um, yeah, look, I've been in AA for uh, about seven years now, a bit over seven years. And um, I had my last drink back on the 11th of February 2009. And uh, a lot has changed in my life, to say the least. So, you know, I, was, um, I started drinking when I was 15 years of age. I'm from a lovely suburb in Sydney called Bankstown. And that's, um, yeah, I drank alcoholically from the start. And I drank alcoholically for 21 years from age 15 to age 36. And, um, yeah, it's, um, there was a lot, a lot of um, alcohol that was actually drunk, actually, to be quiet, the, the, the whole time. I was a better drinker from the start. I eventually, for the last few years of my drinking, I was probably drinking 20 to 30 drinks a day. And, um, I was self-employed. I had enough money coming in each month. I could go to Dan Murphy's a few times a week and I pretty much drank what I wanted to. I didn't realise that I'd isolated in my unit at Clayfield for the last sort of few years and um, it wasn't until I got to an AA meeting that I was realised I was an alcoholic and um, I was 36 years of age. And um, I knew that I was on the way out. I knew that I wasn't going to make it. I just had this sick sort of sense deep within and... Um, you know, the big book it describes me perfectly, uh, the sort of person that I am. I have, um, you know, I've suffered 
Well, I have the grave emotional mental disorders. I've had them since I was a little kid. You know, and as a kid too, I had all sorts of, you know, OCD, touching, checking, counting, hoarding, constantly in fear, worry, anxiety, everything's not going to be okay. And that's how it was. And, you know, that was back in the 70s. It's not like you could really talk about it. Um, though it is a completely different ball game these days. It's, um, you know, fortunately in the second year of my recovery, um, I was a member at the men's meeting in Fortitude Valley. And um, the guys there, they said, look, pick someone from the home group to start getting taken through the big book and the steps. And I, at the time, I'd really sort of scoffed. I thought, as if this is going to help me. Um, I, was, I felt better for the meetings. Um, I was already worried. I thought the meeting's going to cut it for the rest of the, the life. And um, fortunately, I, yeah, I got taken through the big book in quite a structured way, um, doing the steps. And I had a few spiritual type experiences early on, which got me sold on the program. And um, I just kept going because. I experienced the progressive nature of this illness. Um, you know, I was drinking a lot of alcohol in the end and, um, you know, it just it wasn't working. I had a bouquet of, um, what is it, the mental illnesses and um, I was already being hospitalised in the end. So going back to alcohol wasn't really an option. Um, and fortunately, I had that blind faith to keep going and the group was my higher power in the early days. My first sponsor was and some of the blokes and women. Yep, and um, and it's just keep getting better and better. You know, in year three, there were some pretty good days. And, um, you know, I heard at a meeting too, you don't get your old life polished up, you actually get a brand new life. And um, I've had to put the action in. Um, and actually, I thought at the start putting the action in was just not drinking. And then I thought putting the action in was just going to meetings. But it's, um, you know, it's what we learn in these rooms and actually applying it to outside. Um yeah, which, which it's not easy. It's it's up here. You know, our self will that makes it quite difficult. It's, um, but I encourage you know if you identify as an alcoholic or a drug addict, it's um, there yeah, definitely is a solution here. It's all in the big book. It's um, yeah, it sort of revolutionised my life. And um, you know, I've still had some issues go on. You know, if, um, um, family issues can be quite massive. You know, um. I come from a family of drinkers and they're all still drinking. Um, but if you stick with this program and um, uh, put yourself first, it's, um, you know, you need to put yourself first. And um, if things aren't adding up sometimes outside these rooms, we need to speak with people inside these rooms. And, um, yeah, because sometimes, you know, <laughs> another alcoholic can be, the you know, uh, the people that we need to get some good advice from. Yeah, so thanks for asking me to share. I, so I, I used to sort of, I wouldn't say cringe, but I used to hear some of these sort of sayings, but I can't say these days I'm a grateful alcoholic. Um, I know it's a continue, you know, we have a daily reprieve based on the maintenance of a spiritual condition. It's, um, yeah, like that's, that's just how it works. And, uh, yeah, thanks for asking me to share. We've got our last guest speaker, Mal. Mal, would you like to come share a place Good afternoon. My name's Mal. I'm an alcoholic. Hey. Um, anxiety going on here, a bit nervous. And I know it's just the ego. Remember, I was in a, a meeting down in Sydney in the early days. Uh, and... Um, um, I got up down, so I'm feeling a bit nervous. And uh, one of the guys in the front row said, Oh, so I went from there to resent straight away. <laughs> and, um, yeah. Yes, yeah, so it's just it's the ego. And, uh, I, I said, I mean, if I've actually shared all the things what I've asked about two weeks ago, so now, I'll tell you up a couple of hours, you know. But again, again, that's all there you go, all that stuff on in the press and all the spiritual and humble, you know. And, um, and I was just thinking there, you know, uh, today, I don't know who I am, but I know who I'm not. 
and who I'm not, start off with other people's beliefs. Now you can not use you can use this enabled thing. Then through my addiction, I could reinforce those beliefs. I'm a loser. Yeah, go and have a life, but no friend. But again, that's all the ego. Yeah, so there's two sides. Now one side, you tell people, you know, you just know the bad. No, 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 no. So the flip side of the ego is trying to put across its image, you know, look cool, you know, look shit together, I'm going places. And what this program has taught me, you know, and I suppose it's connecting with the real self, the God self, whatever, you know, the person I was born to be, you know, and that's my ongoing journey. You know. And basically, I suppose it's just known to be love, caring, you know, empathy, giving. You know. It's the opposite way I live. Mean. For me to be able to do that, just to be able to acknowledge the ego, you know, when it kicks in there. And I think I've talked about the ego is a patient of death. Yeah. Unfortunately, it can't be destroyed. But it's, you know. And the more I, I, I acknowledge the ego, the bigger you get, because it's not really me, and that's the full self. The more I'm able to acknowledge that, yeah. And it cooks and it kicks in. I'm, I'm, I'm cruising around my heart, you know, trying to look cool, you know, I'm looking good, you know. And the good thing about it, the wrap around sunglasses, so I glance at the side of your eyes, so you weren't something checking out, you know. <laughs> I see someone else, but I get you know, you got yourself, you know, show off, you know. That's good. Now, be able to acknowledge that, recognize it. Because that's, the more I share it, the more it deflates it. Because all the ego did is humiliate me, you know. And through the program, it's about getting to the humility. Learn to love and accept yourself exactly as you know? The ego's there or whatever. You know, just kind of acknowledge it. And the more I'm able to do that, the freer I am you know, to be me. You know, that love and acceptance of myself. You know? Without having to try and impress the cool, sound, humble, spiritual, whatever. You know? And so it, it, it's true that through that ego deflation, you know, the more I, I can deflate the ego, the more I allow God to inflate it. The more I am you know, in the moment, which is that thing that's real, the sound of the things you find here right now. The thing that separates me, you know, I start projecting, you know. And, I'm up and down two weeks ago thinking about all these wonderful, smart, intelligent, you know, and even the only thing you're going to say is how you share it to me. So it's all that projecting, you know. And it doesn't happen so much today that when I sit down, I used to be, oh, shit, I should have said this, I should have said, you know. The more I'm able to do that, you know, acknowledge it, it's all that stuff, you know. All that stuff, you know, and student fears, change of the past, you know, and it starts projecting in the future, you know, and it takes me away from being right here right now. That's where my God, my higher power, through the universe is. The more I'm connected with that, that power, the more connected, you know, at peace, you know, serene, happy, joyous, and free, I feel so. The more I'm in that moment, the more I'm connected with you. It's all that stuff. Yeah. Big text character, whatever you want to call them. Not seven baby things, it's all emotions. Yeah. All just emotions. Yeah. We still talk about emotions and body, it's about growing up, connecting with the other dinner body. Emotions aren't good or bad, right or wrong. To me, they've got given indicators of what's going on in my life. And the fear coming up, of course, you know, we go and start to predict, you know, in the future, you know, shame, going back in the past. 
and for me today, the time we've just been able to acknowledge that. I can call it a big night. And like the, one of the cliches I'm going to talk about, and I don't hear spoken a lot about that, is think, think, think. My problem is I'd have a thought and I'd react. Yeah. And so think, 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 think it through. Yeah. Knowledge of thought. What happens? I have a thought, there's emotions attached to that, and there's a, either a response or a reaction. Sometimes it's just like that, from the thought to the information. It's all ways of thought that triggers that information. Sometimes it's identifying the thought, or kids, the emotion kicks in, sometimes the emotion kicks in, and then the anger, jealousy, insecurity, whatever. Sometimes it's a matter of acknowledging that, and sometimes it starts to run away before I get on it. And I, I, I shared with the last night, you know, I was certainly just doing the thing Name last night, and then stuff happened other than that. This is the first time I've got a dog, so I'm stuck up here. I'm looking for it at the moment. I'm sure people heard about it. And, and then you know. and in reality, that brings up my old stuff there, and patients, and you know, starting out, I'll do so whatever. You know. And I start projecting in which I've done the and I start projecting into what's going to happen in the world schemes, cover up all that stuff. And the truth is, the more you get to know the simple end, but acknowledge it as well as where I was at last night with that stuff. And then, you know, start feeling angry, you know, resentful. Yeah. And such a powerful thing, as you said. Just been able to acknowledge it. Sometimes it's just better to acknowledge it yourself. Sometimes I need to share it with a friend or 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 write it at a meeting. It loses power. Like yeah. that first step. Yeah. While I deny and try and control it, fix it or whatever, yeah. it's just destroying me. And then it wouldn't take my life. Yeah. And it's through that acknowledging, yeah. thinking, acknowledging. I'm powerless, my life, I manage all that is the loss of power. So you want to destroy me. And that's the same thing that applies to my feelings and those thoughts going on today. And I learned to get acknowledge it. Instead of trying to force it, and if I should, I'm saying that you say that I shouldn't be thinking this way, or I should be on your phone, or I should be on your bullshit. This is where I'm at right here, right here. So for me, just learn to acknowledge that. You might do that instead of thinking that the things is power. And to bring you back right here, right here. And that's when I'm injured. And you think Facebook, you know, that, um, you can say, oh, it's really dark, and it's interesting to do it. And for me, that's when you bring you in. Yeah. Young, spiritual. And I'm just real so grateful, you know, that I am not only saving my life, but it's giving me a life and never been possible. Yeah. And after night as well, I go, I like dancing. Mm-hmm. I love dancing. I do that up and down and rock and roll and do dancing, you know. And as soon as people get out and do it in the last night, I'm in one of the rooms just recovering. Mm-hmm. I remember the first time I ever tried it a few months later, you know, self conscious, self centered. Now I'm having a in the laugh and you know my reason. And a mate of mine there, he's been tough to say that. He sometimes he just out against one self, let himself go, you know. And I put him to put him aside, so I've got a bit self conscious, you know. Find a privilege to you, whatever. He said, No one worry about that, brother. He said, That's a big worry about them. Worry about what they're doing. Mm-hmm. And that's the truth in mind. Mm-hmm. It doesn't just apply to us, our, we're not in. You're not unique. I'm not trying to not be clear with that. I was going to think about all the people. Except we're giving them thinking. People have to have fears, thoughts, insecurities, ego, whatever. The only major difference between me and them, if I don't deal with the stuff, it's going to kill me. And I just feel so blessed and I'm grateful for that. I'm not a holiday. It's giving me the programs, giving me my life, it's giving me the people. 
Thank you for tuning in. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.